Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Welcome to part two of my beginner's guide to designing encounters. Uh, this is a series that I kind of revisited from some earlier advice videos that I did uh, a couple years back. And what I really want to do is just try to provide some uh, tips and tricks that can help uh, beginners, uh, new dungeon masters to the game, uh, find ways to develop encounters, first of all, and then find ways to make them more interesting and then use them to design a, a scenario or an adventure, which will be the third part of this series. So in part one, we looked at the basics of encounter design as outlined by the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, if you recall, uh, in that video, we had made up several encounter groups, which I have here. Uh, we have a small patrol, standard patrol, elite encounter, and final encounter. Uh, so today we're not going to deal so much with these, but these are the sample encounters that I'm going to be continuously using uh, throughout this series, just to show how you can take the simple things that you've set up uh, at the very beginning and try to make something interesting out of them. So now the next thing I want to talk about is just finding ways to make encounters seem a little bit more interesting or dynamic. Uh, as a dungeon master, and I'm sure you know others have done it. I know I've been guilty of this on more than one occasion, of simply falling into the trap of saying, you know, you open like if you're in a dungeon, you open up the door. Here's the enemy's roll initiative, or you see the creatures, you know, coming at you, or they ambush you. Roll initiative, and you just kind of get in the the concept of basically just throwing the monsters at the party, having them roll initiative, and they fight sort of out either in this, you know, like a 20 by 20 room or out in the wilderness, and there's not really a whole lot more to it. And it can, it's one of those things that can get uh, repetitive and it can get kind of uh, tedious, and it's something that can kind of wear on the players. Uh, in my opinion, it's one of the reasons why, in a lot of cases, uh, large dungeon crawls aren't as favorable these days as they used to be, just because it feels sort of like a routine of, you know, you open up the door, there's enemies, you roll initiative, you fight, and you go to the next room and do the same. Uh, so in this one, I just want to talk about just a few tips and a few ways that you can make sort of the encounters a little bit more interesting. Uh, using some minor uh, minor things, you can change around sort of the, the makeup of, an, of a group of enemies, uh, use environmental effects, so we'll kind of start from there. Now, uh, the first thing I want to do is just go back to the encounters that we made, and the encounters I'm going to discuss today are going to involve our uh, least powerful encounter, our small patrol, which is two orcs and a wolf. Now, when I had first done the video, uh, part one, I had said that I wanted, you know, the wolf just for something a little bit different, uh, or a smaller creature, but there was another reason for that, and that's because I want to use the wolves in such a way that uh, makes an encounter a little bit more interesting or potentially dynamic, and gives the player some options on how they want to proceed with the encounter. So, I called it this encounter using the two small patrols that we have here from before, I like to call this Orcs versus Wolves, and the idea is that you can have the Orcs have trained wolves or domesticated wolves that they use as, um, you know, watch animals um, or, you know, pets or even, you know, things like that. But if you're running sort of a more wilderness-based uh, encounter or, or adventures, then one of the things that you can actually do is have monsters in an encounter actually face off against one another. So there's a couple of different ways that I would use those the, the orcs versus wolves encounter uh, for the player character. So the first one involves the player characters hearing the sounds of combat uh, erupting not too far from where they are. So basically they get there uh, after a single round of combat. So you've got, I don't know how well it's going to show up here, but I've just got a couple of uh, these swirly circle things. These are supposed to be trees. So you have your player characters kind of come up take cover behind some trees and what they discover is that there are uh, there's a patrol of orcs being attacked by a pair of wolves so you've got our two small patrols which is two orcs and a wolf and then you've got two orcs and a wolf and basically the wolves are facing off against the orcs when the player characters arrive. So now you have sort of a more dynamic encounter. You have the fact that this is the wilderness and there are wild animals in the wilderness uh, that can attack the enemies as much as they can attack the player characters. And one of the things that it does is it creates sort of a sense of realism in the, uh, in the campaign world in that not everything the player characters encounter or face are only going to be interested in attacking them. And that's one of the things that can also happen with just frequent uh, roll for initiative, you know, standard encounters. So with this, they see that, you know, maybe they were attacked by wolves earlier, uh, but now you see that the orcs that they're up against are similarly being attacked by wolves. 
And so it gives like so the player character some option. Now, if you want to take an even more realistic approach, or if you're afraid that having the four orcs and the two wolves at the same time may be a bit more challenging of an encounter than you're looking for, <coughs> then you can have the uh, some of the orcs and even one of the wolves potentially have damage on them. Uh, so they, what I had done here was just set this up so that the player characters um, hear the sounds of combat nearby. Uh, the wolves attack the orcs, and they get to, to investigate on the second round of combat, at the very beginning of the second round. So what we have is two of the orcs have taken a single hit from uh, the wolves. So let's just say we've got uh, we've got the wolves. Well, no, we can have the wolves still split up. So we got the wolves split up like this. They're attacking, you know, each attacking a pair of orcs. Um, one of the orcs would have been hit by the wolf, and uh, I think the wolf's standard attack, just using the uh, basic damage range in the monster manual, is seven points of damage, I believe. Um, so, we just have two orcs that were hit, ambushed by the wolves. Each of them have taken seven points of damage off of their 15 hit points, giving them a grand total of eight hit points remaining, which makes them a little bit easier to deal with, because now they've got uh, about the same hit points as a common goblin. Uh, you know, one more than them, but it makes them a little bit easier to the point where the player characters can probably take out the injured orcs in a single attack from the fighter or a well-placed magic missile uh, from the wizard. So that makes that a lot easier. Now, in retaliation, one of the uh, wolves has taken a pretty nasty hit from one of the orcs. And um, the orcs ended up doing their, again, just using their uh, set damage range that's in the monster manual. Uh, has dealt uh, a wound to the wolf, uh, leaving it with only two hit points remaining. Because their standard hit, if they hit the, the wolf once, would reduce a wolf from full to two HP. So that's going to make that wolf a lot easier to deal with. Now at this point, when the player characters see this, uh, again, give them the option of how they want to proceed. They can certainly join in the combat if they wish, you know, moving in and taking on the stragglers, or they can let the scenario play out. if that's something that they want to do. If they want to, you know, let the two combatants uh, wear each other down and then just pick off the rest. So, when using this kind of encounter, uh, one of the important things to do is to make sure that you kind of award the experience points accordingly if you're having two groups of monsters uh, battling each other. Uh, for example, in this particular instance, we have two orcs that have been reduced by about half their hit points and we have one wolf that's only two hit points away from death, meaning that a single magic missile bolt uh, from the three that the first level spell generates is guaranteed to kill the wolf. Now, the player characters won't know that, but as a dungeon master, you do. So, in this situation, you may want to reduce some of the experience point re rewards for uh, the encounter. If the player characters rush right in as things are, what I would suggest is just removing um, or reducing the experience points by uh, one... Uh, by one orc. So instead of awarding experience for four orcs, you give them experience for three because two of the orcs have been reduced to half their hit points, uh, effectively making them easier. Now that's not something that you necessarily have to do, but it's just a suggestion. As far as the wolf goes, again, you probably want to give like half experience points or even give no experience points for the wounded wolf if it doesn't get to do anything else in the encounter. If the player characters just walk over, easily kill it before it even gets a chance to attack. Um, you can basically say that the orcs did all the work there and they just kind of, you know, finish it off type of thing. And conversely, any of these uh, monsters that are killed by other monsters, uh, the experience points would not go to the player characters. But it does give the players the opportunity to sit back, let their opponents weaken each other before they attack. Um, so it just, again, gives sort of an option. It gives a bit more layers to just a traditional combat. So you can have the players roll initiative and then just say, you know, we're going to wait it out. And then you have, you know, a wolf die, you have one of the orcs die, uh, maybe the other wounded orc gets killed, and now suddenly you're down to just a standard patrol of two orcs and a wolf, and they move in and do their thing. So just one of the things that you can do uh, with this encounter. Now another option would be to have the player characters face off against the orcs using the two small patrols that we have uh, but not introducing the wolves right away so for example what we do is we just kinda have them set up sort of like this make sure that you can see everybody so you have uh, the encounter the players think it's just a standard patrol of four orcs uh, but really what this is is there's a pair of wolves that are hiding you can let the player characters make uh, a perception check or, if you don't want to tip them off, uh, just have them use their basic uh, passive perception. 
Uh, the other thing is you could have them make their perception check, uh, knowing fully well that you want them to see the orcs. Uh, making the player characters think that they're making the perception check to see if they spot the orcs, but really have it to see if they spot the wolves that are currently hiding. So they could be, you know, behind the trees, sort of like this, when the player characters uh, make their way into the combat. Uh, if you're using miniatures, it's best not to set the, uh, the hidden enemies down right away. Let the, uh, the combat unfold. And what I would do with this encounter is starting on the second round of combat. So the first Round of combat just goes to the player characters versus the orcs. So they sort of do their thing. You know, the orcs, uh, you know, do their damage. They take the damage made with the player characters. Uh, severely wound one of them. And this is where the wolves jump in. So uh, starting at the second round of combat, you would have the wolves initiative already done. Have them move in. And you can make this a bit more dynamic as well in that maybe instead of just having them go blindly after the player characters or blindly after one of the orcs, you could have the wolves jump on and try to attack the most heavily wounded uh, creature or individual involved in the combat. So let's just say that um, our Dwarven Wizard takes a pretty nasty hit uh, from the Orc and he's only got a couple hit points left before he loses consciousness. So he's bleeding, you know, he looks you know, very ragged, he's, it's hard for him to kind of keep his feet. So when the wolves enter the battlefield, everybody else is more or less fine, very, you know, lightly wounded, if, if wounded at all. So you have the wolves kind of jump out and attack the most heavily damaged creature that's on there, the one that's closest to death. Not the most damaged overall, but the one that has the fewest hit points remaining. And then they take that out, and again, it creates another sense of sort of danger and risk in the encounter, because now you've got your most heavily wounded individual uh, being attacked by something else on top of everything that they were fighting before and it makes it a bit more difficult again and it's likely that in this situation where this was meant to be um, a um, a hard encounter to begin with now you've got a situation where one of the characters uh, could potentially be dropped down to zero hit points conversely if one of the orcs is closest to death then you could just have the wolf come in and finish that orc off uh, if it's only got like one or two hit points left or you know even up to three or four uh, you can just basically have it come in and finish the orc off without having to roll NPC versus NPC combat. But let's just say that that happens. Uh, so the wolves come in, they attack one of the orcs that was, you know, heavily wounded. And um, then, you know, the second wolf would go after the next most wounded uh, individual. So that could be maybe the fighter or, you know, the, the cleric in the back. So just a couple of uh, tips and advice for using our standard encounters that we had set up. So our typical like sample encounter groups that we've made, that we plan on using, but presenting them in a way that's different or interesting versus just having them, you know, find uh, four orcs and two wolves and then rolling for initiative and fighting it out. So it's just a way to make things a little bit more interesting. Uh, so that's one way to sort of modify encounters. So let's look at another set of examples that we can do using terrain. So one of the simplest and most basic uses of terrain features to create um, a more challenging or difficult or more realistic sort of combat scenario is simply by utilizing uh, cover, for example. So let's just say using our orc standard patrol of four orcs, let's just say that two of them are archers, actually you know, equipped with short bows or long bows or whichever of the two that you want to use. Um, now, instead of just having them sort of out in the open where they're fully exposed, you could have them, the player characters, encounter these orcs near the ruins of maybe an old building or uh, perhaps like ruins of an ancient settlement or something where there's just uh, low walls uh, that have crumbled over time but still provide enough encounter or cover to make an encounter more interesting. So, for example, we've got our archers uh, in behind the cover. So the cover increases their armor class. Um, it also uh, give, provides a bonus to any dexterity saving throws that they make because they can simply uh, duck behind the cover. Uh, the amount of cover that you want to give is certainly up to you, uh, but just using this, it makes these easier encounters more difficult uh, to do. So it just means that it's going to take more now, it's going to take higher rolls, and it's going to take potentially more spells if the player characters are casting spells at the party to get the uh, to actually defeat the enemies. Now you could have the other two orcs uh, act as sort of a buffer so that the player characters can't easily get towards the other 
uh, individuals with cover. And if we're using our uh, small patrols, and say creating a more difficult encounter with the two of them, then this could be where they have the trained wolves. So you're taking the two encounter groups uh, and making a more dynamic uh, sort of encounter based off of that. Again, the cover makes it difficult for the player characters to defeat the archers. The archers, you know, get the benefit of uh, being able to make a few more attacks, potentially inflicting a bit more damage on the player characters. And now the players have to decide how they want to proceed. Um, if, for example, you know, they're sort of like in a wide open area uh, facing down towards the cover, then they have to choose if they want to try to uh, get around for example, to see if they can sneak around the side and you know get behind the cover to take out the archers, or uh, since we've got enemies that are going to try to stop them from doing that, uh, do they just kind of charge in, try to take care of the melee combatants first, and hope that you know the archers just don't you know hit properly? Uh, so those are a couple of options to uh, to think about and uh, to potentially use. Um, another thing that you can do with terrain uh, in this situation is create. Um, use elevations to enhance or change the way that uh, these encounters go down. So for example, let's just say the player characters are making their way and if you want you can have sort of like a a high thing of elevation here that's just to say plus you know uh, 40 feet and then just kinda have it go down like this and uh, just indicate that this is very steep and my handwriting is terrible I apologize for that but you can sort of have this scenario where the player characters are now um, being attacked by again potentially a group of archers up on a higher elevation which forces a battle that would normally be uh, something that could be done in melee. So in this case, we'd give bows to all of them. I just only have the two uh, minis with uh, with bows on me right now. But you could have, instead of just being like a standard run-in uh, type of encounter where the player characters just kind of charge in, try to attack the uh, the orcs, uh, now they have to deal with the fact that they're at a lower elevation, which gives them sort of a disadvantage when fighting. Uh, also, uh, it makes it so that you know you want all of your characters now to have ranged attacks, which is something that they should do anyway. So even your your fighter, your you know frontline uh, tanky fighter character that's all about just having like high armor class, fighting in melee, they should have a ranged weapon. Uh, and if they don't have a ranged weapon, and you've been trying to get them to have a ranged weapon, an encounter like this can show them the importance of actually having something like uh, a, even if it's like a crossbow or a shortbow or just something so that they can, you know, be useful in any combat situation. If the party's ill prepared for a predominantly ranged uh, encounter, uh, be mindful of that. Like if you've been trying to get s someone to buy a ranged weapon and they refuse, then by all means use this to kind of show them the importance of having that. Uh, however, if it's just something that has been a complete oversight of theirs, and you've never really um, pushed the issue or never even really considered it yourself, just kind of stop and think that if you know the player characters can't deal with this encounter, you're going to either force them to retreat or kind of frustrate them that you design something that they can't potentially fight back against. So it's one thing to be kind of mindful of that, but again, if you're trying to teach a lesson to the character that doesn't want to have a ranged weapon, then that's a great way to do it. Another situation that this comes in handy is because even though the cliff is steep, the characters can still try to climb it, and that's the total option that they have. So if um, one of the things that I'd seen was uh, somebody complain about one of their character or one of their players in their group who was a barbarian and all they ever did was just charge in and destroy everything. And uh, as the dungeon master, he was trying to find ways to make it so that they can't just keep doing that because it was very frustrating. And one of the suggestions was, you know, uh, find ways to slow them down, and uh, this is a way that you could do that having the barbarian or melee oriented character have to make athletics checks uh, to climb up is something that's going to um, you know make them think about how they play their character hopefully but it also again makes it so that their other characters will have chances to do things while this one's just trying to get into the combat um, now if he's climbing up and you know you could have one of the orc archers or a couple of the orc archers concentrate their fire on him 
uh, or her so that they don't um, get to the top. So basically if they take a hit, make them make another uh, athletics check to avoid falling down basically because they just got struck for, you know, for damage by an attack. And it's just, again, it's something that can be done in sort of an interesting way that makes, uh, again, just a seemingly normal average encounter feel a little bit more uh, interesting, like there's just more to it. And it changes the way that the characters have to approach uh, the combat. Um, another thing that you could do as well would just be to have um, difficult terrain if you have a character that likes to charge a lot, uh, for example. So going back to the runes uh, that I had before, uh, you could just have, like, packs of dense rubble uh, that the character would have to either run around or run through, uh, which would slow them down enough that, again, the orcs may get a couple rounds of attacks off, or it gives the other characters a chance to do something. So, difficult terrain is something that you can also use. Um, so, if you want to prevent somebody from always constantly just charging in and, you know, taking all the fun from the other player characters. So, so those are some of the more basic things that you can do, but there are also ways to make environmental things uh, just seem a little bit more, you know, add a little bit more to uh, an average mundane combat. So, let's just say that our player characters stumble across an orc camp. So the orcs have like a, a roaring fire going, you know, big bonfire that they have set up. And this could be a way to take some of the uh, like, let's just say we had two of the standard patrol, so we had like eight orcs total in here um, around the fire. Just, you know, camping, resting, uh, not really on patrol. So we just got them set up sort of like, sort of like that, just kind of haphazardly uh, thrown around there. Now the player characters can hide behind like a tree, which we'll just use as, again, just these little swirly marks just so we can kind of set them up on here. So let's just say the player characters stumble across uh, a group of orcs uh, at a camp. So the orcs aren't, again, paying attention to what's going on, they're not on patrol. The player characters just ended up discovering where they were resting. Normally, this encounter could be technically considered a deadly encounter because this is eight orcs against the four player characters, which if we go back using our multipliers and stuff, Two standard patrols, eight orcs, it makes for a deadly encounter for four third level characters. So a way to make this a little bit easier is the orcs don't have their weapons on them. So let's just say that there is um, like a log over here and they just have all their weapons uh, up against that. And you know again those are really bad swords, a really bad bow, but you just kind of have it look like their weapons are not easily within their reach. So with that in mind, the player characters get a chance to act. So you know you could give them a surprise round, which helps a lot. Uh, or even if the orcs do discover them, uh, they're all basically unarmed. So how do we make this encounter a little bit more interesting? So for these bonfires, the idea that I had is that, and this is actually something that I had recently done, uh, just yesterday actually, at the time that I'm recording this, um, so the orcs weren't prepared, but they have, you know, logs by the fire, or they're using clubs or wooden-based weapons when, the, when they spot the player characters. The orcs know that they're not all going to be able uh, to uh, grab their weapons without some of them dying uh, in the process. So in order to try to slow the player characters down or let their, you know, comrades or allies pick up their weapons, three of them just pick up... Uh, heavy log, you know, some of the wooden logs uh, that were going to be used for the fire, or that are maybe just put in the fire, pull them out, and now they've got basically improvised clubs while the rest go and grab their weapons. So these three grab these logs, wooden logs, or pieces of wood, or even if just have them use clubs or great clubs, and have them stick it in the fire to the point where the weapon catches fire. Uh, they can then charge towards the player characters uh, to, you know, again, kind of press press them into attacking. And what you can do is, again, just do some simple stuff, you know, run sort of a normal combat. Um, you know, the orcs, I wouldn't give them a disadvantage on attacking because, you know, they basically just pick up a large heavy object, uh, set it on fire, and swing it. So that's something that should still be within their, 
their wheelhouse, so to speak. But one of the things that you can do is, again, just because they lit these things on fire, or they pulled them out of the fire, is if they hit, they would do their normal damage for like a club or a great club, which I think is a D8 for a great club. And uh, just have it do like a D4 of fire damage, not like a full-blown D6, not something that's going to uh, be completely overpowered, but you have them now with these flaming uh, pieces of wood that they're hitting the player characters with, and the, you know when they get hit, the fire burns them a bit, and you deal the extra damage. If you want to make this a bit more realistic, because this isn't uh, something that's designed specifically as a weapon and it is improvised, you could always have the weapon potentially break. So if the, the orc rolls a natural 1, or even if they roll a natural 20, you could say that the, the object that they're holding breaks because of the force put behind it. So the things that you can do with that, but that just gives a little bit of time for the other orcs to get their weapons. And again, um, you know, be able to attack with their ranged attacks and do all that stuff. So it makes the player characters have to choose if they want to go after the unarmed creatures or if they want to deal with the ones with the uh, the, the logs that are, you know, like the improvised clubs that are fl that are burning uh, that are also advancing towards them. So it's just a way, again, you know, you kind of have them surprise the, the orcs. You know, you have them at their camp and it's just a way of Instead of just spending a turn having everybody going and grabbing their weapons, you could have a few of them say, we're going to distract the rest. And, um, you know, again, stick their clubs uh, or stick these logs in the fire, pull the logs out of the fire that were just put in and use them to uh, threaten the player characters with. So, again, just one other example of things that you could sort of do uh, with, um, you know, what could be just sort of a standard combat scenario that makes it a little bit more interesting. So the last one that I really want to discuss, and the last one that I thought of for the purposes of this video, would be having the player characters encounter a group of orcs on a bridge, essentially that's spanning a, uh, a river or a deep river. So we've got just our uh, bridge set up. Now again, I'm not going to do anything super fancy, just for the purposes of this video. Okay, so let's just say that, you know, here's our bridge. And then down below, we have our deep, deep water. And you could say that this is, you know, quite deep. If you want, you know, normally you probably make it larger than this, but I just want everything to kind of show up in camera and just uh... right, and you could say that you know the water is let's just say um, 15 feet deep just so the player characters know so let's just say you've got an encounter where they're on a bridge uh, which is something that happens you know sometimes a lot of times I've just used sort of like bridges and rivers and stuff like that as sort of just window dressing for the encounter but there are ways that you can also make this sort of interesting. So we've got our character set up here. And let's just have our orc set up. All right. Okay. So there we've got our orcs, we've got our player characters, we've got the combat going. Now let's just say our fighter for example, is wearing plate armor, you know, the heaviest armor that they have. Um, the orcs wearing stuff like leather armor or like lighter based armors may decide that trying to fight this heavily armored creature face on is not going to go well for them if they're just trying to exchange blows. But what they do know is that the water underneath the bridge is relatively deep. Deep enough that a heavily armored character may have difficulty getting out of the water. Now again, you may want to have a wider river, you could have it deeper, there's all kinds of things that you could do, but on the orc's turn, rather than trying to attack normally, in this situation you could have the orc try to basically grapple and push the fighter off of the edge. And then that way, you know, if the, if the heavily armored character falls into the water, now suddenly they're kind of removed temporarily from the combat. Um, swim checks are going to be extremely difficult because they're wearing, you know, heavy plates of metal that weigh them down. So they may have to trudge other way out of the out of the river, 
or you could have some other complication. Uh, for example, if you know they end up having only a few hit points left, you could say or you know, have them roll to see if they strike their head on like a rock or something as they make their way down. And if they do, then they're unconscious, and that makes it so that the other characters up here have to decide if they're going to continue battling the orcs or if they're going to break away from the combat to try to rescue their friend. So it's just again another way that you can sort of make the environmental uh, aspects of the you know the encounter. Uh, play a role and something that you can do with them to make them seem more interesting. Uh, one of the things that I've seen uh, a lot of times is to have, if you're doing like um, um, a dungeon based adventure or if they're in a cave, have them over this like large natural crevice, you know, like on a thin, narrow stone bridge, and have them like potentially be pushed off that. Um, my recommendation would be, um, especially if you're beginning, you don't want to design your encounters to flat out kill your player characters. Uh, there should always be a way for the characters to kind of overcome or at least escape the encounter that they're in. So my recommendation would be instead of having like this large, uh, you know, crevice or, um, you know, thing like that in like an Underdark scenario or a dungeon setting where the fall is likely going to kill the character flat out, um, my recommendation would be to do something more along these lines where it's going to be an inconvenience uh, for the character and it could put them potentially at risk but it's not going to outright kill them just because again this these videos are for beginners these are for people that are new and your players may not enjoy coming into encounters where just because they failed a single like strength athletics check um, their character got pushed into a chasm and died type of thing but having you know the heavily armored character pushed off a bridge and have to spend you know the next two or three rounds just trying to you know get out of the deeper water to the point where they can trying to make their way back into the encounter is something that's going to be a little bit more memorable and something that's not going to be one of those things that's like well the DM's just out to kill me so again my recommendation would be to try to do stuff that uh, could take characters out of the encounter for a period of time but not necessarily try to make them 100 percent lethal um, now along the lines of lethality uh, my advice would be to try to keep um, the encounters more or less balanced for the, the player characters um, which is something that we will see in the next video. So most of the encounters that you should be using would be either uh, easier, medium, difficulty, and then doing these things can make these easier encounters feel a little bit more difficult without making them artificially deadly. Uh, now the last thing is how often should you use these types of uh, encounters? How often should you incorporate uh, environmental effects? Or how often should you have like groups of enemies attacking one another? Um, or how often should you utilize cover and things to slow down the, the, or impede the player character's progress, like higher elevations. My recommendation would be to use these often enough that the player characters never become complacent with battle and just think, oh, we're just going to charge at each other or smash to each other into the middle of the battlefield and fight that way. But not every encounter should have sort of like a gimmick to it like this. And the reason that I say that is, if every encounter incorporated the environment and incorporated all these other things uh, every single time, then none of them feel special. None of them feel memorable. You know, if you um, fight the party, you know, if the party fights, you know, on the bridge one encounter, and then the next encounter, you know, the orcs are behind cover, or the next one they're, you know, on this higher elevation and the characters don't have you know, the ranged weapons to deal with them, or, you know, the next time you, you know, you constantly find these two groups of enemies uh, always fighting each other and the player characters just kind of get the chance to sit back and do nothing, none of these encounters feel like they stand out. But if you have, you know, two or three of the standard encounters where you just roll initiative and come together in this, you know, big, you know, combat type of scenario, and then all of a sudden you have something like this, where the character, you know, the fighter may get knocked off the bridge, or the fighter could do the same thing and knock the orcs off to thin their numbers. Um, then that's going to be a little bit more memorable. That's going to stand out a lot, a lot more. Um, if you're constantly doing stuff like this, then again, they don't feel special, and that's also a lot more work that you're having to put into every single encounter. So try to use them sparingly. Use these sort of situations, you know, once in a while. Uh, but try to have it so that you know they, when they happen, it feels nice and it, it breaks up, you know, the regular. Uh, feel of how the encounters kind of tend to flow. Uh, make these encounters feel special, uh, make them feel interesting, uh, but don't make them feel routine. Like don't have one, like every third encounter incorporate some sort of element to it. Uh, even if you have two back-to-back -back encounters, like let's just say, um, you know, you've got 
the situation with the bridge, and then the next encounter is uh, with you know orc archers behind a wall. That's fine. Just don't overdo it, and then maybe have the next encounter or two after that just be regular, standard ones where the two groups just kind of run at each other and sort of do that thing. So anyway, uh, those are just some thoughts on ways to make interesting uh, encounters, to take standard encounters and just put a new wrinkle into them sort of thing. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any other suggestions that you'd like to leave behind for ways to make uh, encounters a little bit more interesting or dynamic, please don't hesitate to leave those in the comments below. And if there's any other questions or concerns that uh, you, particularly beginner or novice dungeon masters have when it comes to running combats or designing encounters, uh, please don't hesitate to ask that either. I'd like to take any opportunities that I can uh, to help beginners, to help teach the game. So if you have any questions, please leave them below. And uh, again, I hope you found this video helpful. And I hope that you picked up at least a couple of ideas to make your encounters a little bit more interesting. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this series so far. And uh, be sure to come back for part three, which is going to likely be the last part of this series, unless I have some other things that people want me to add on to it. But what we're going to do in the next video is take the standard encounters that we created. Uh, we're going to take some of these um, environmental ideas and we're going to use these two things to combine these two videos together to design a dungeon and populate it with our encounter. So I hope you look forward to seeing that. I look forward to recording it. Uh, again, thank you guys very much for watching. We'll see you next time.